is an undeniable pursuit. John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do except God is with him. And Jesus answered and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. <laughs> You know, when you read this scripture in John, it's amazing anything that Jesus says. It's filled with ambiguity, isn't it? But Christianity doesn't see it like that. They see it pretty cut and dry. Christianity creates clarity even in the midst of obscurity. It declares Christianity, even when it's surrounded by ambivalence, it says, we see well. <clears throat> Why is that? Because religion always follows this path. Ready? Teach, learn, apply. Teach, learn, apply. That's religion's path. That's the path of all religion. And that is absolutely the path of Christianity. Teach, learn, apply. <clears throat> How many have ever argued with someone who believed differently than you? Early Christian writers defended their beliefs against critics and recommended their way of believing to outsiders. They were called apologists. How many have ever heard that word? Apologetics is speaking in defense of something. Christian apologetics is reasoned arguments to justify and defend the Christian way. When a person says, that's what I believe, or that's how I think, they literally say at that point, yeah, but that's what I believe. Yeah, but that's how I think. At that point, they say, I've put up a fence in my mind that I won't cross. Because that's how I believe. How do you believe? Like this. You figure you could change. Absolutely not. This is my fence. It's my belief. Matthew 6. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is single, the whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is evil, the whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? This is kind of a, a cool scripture. I, don't you wish you could, you could hear Jesus say these things? Don't you wish you could actually hear his voice when he said it? He didn't say it like you read it when you read Scripture. There was, there was feeling in his voice. Just because Christianity told you that light is the equivalent of good and darkness is wickedness doesn't make it so. Just because Christianity says light is good and darkness is wickedness, it doesn't make it true. Remember, Scripture was interpreted by men whose influence came completely through the Catholic Church. You understand that, right? So all their influence, even while they were writing down what they were dissecting out of Scripture, came from what they had heard from the Catholic Church. Yes. Light in Scripture has to do with what? Wisdom. Wisdom and understanding. Darkness always has to do with ignorance. Ignorance. The word ignorance, if you look it up in Webster, it literally means this, lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge. It's exactly what Hosea prophesied would be the reason for the body of Christ remaining impotent. Ignorance. My people are destroyed. Hosea could have said that. My people are destroyed because of ignorance. Darkness. 
Hosea's prophecy retranslated is, my people are powerless due to the lack of light. My people are powerless due to the lack of wisdom, due to the lack of understanding. So Jesus said that light comes from the eye of the body. How many understand that? Okay, so all of a sudden Jesus goes, light is from the eye, or the eye of the body. So now I've got to figure out, who was he talking about, or what was he talking about? The eye of the body are those who claim to have understanding. Those who claim to see. That's the eye of the body. Who is that? Pastors, teachers, prophets, priests, all those who claim to see enough to tell you their wisdom are the eye of the body. But if the eye has been corrupted, then the entire body walks in darkness. Yes, that's right. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't it easier to understand? <clears throat> and that darkness, Jesus said, or that way of believing is virtually unchangeable. He said when the body walks in darkness, and that darkness represents ignorance, or a way of believing that's deceived, then the entire body walks in ignorance when the eye's been corrupted. I read this the other day. If a man is born ignorant to parents who are ignorant, in a society that's ignorant, and he lives a life of ignorance, and eventually dies ignorant, ignorance is a norm. To him and to life. So indoctrination to the ignorant can be called education. Hypnotism can be called entertainment. Criminals can be called leaders and lies can be called truth because his mind was never truly his own. What an amazing thought. When I read it, in the, in the situation I read it, and he was talking about governments. But how many knows it? How many you understand that it's applicable to religions also? The scariest part of the Christian religion is that we've been taught to deny that it's a religion at all. How many from the very beginning you said, this, we are not a religion, we are what? A relationship. What did Jesus tell you after breakfast this morning? Well, we're not that close. <laughs> it's been called a personal relationship, hasn't it? How many have ever heard? Christianity is a personal relationship. You know what that does? It creates the illusion that, we, that all we believe is came to us not through teachings or flawed humanity, but that it came, all of it came to us through God Himself. If I say that I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then it creates this illusion that everything I believe came to me from God. Isn't it true? No Christian will ever admit the origins of all that they believe and hold as absolute truth came from a potentially corrupted influence. And if the eye is corrupted, he said, then the whole body walks in deception. When your truth is contaminated, Jesus said, how great is that deception? When your truth becomes contaminated because of the lack of understanding. How great is that darkness? When Jesus said it, he was literally credulous. It's hard for him to accept the depth of darkness that he could see coming to the church. How many know when Jesus talked, he was prophesying? And he was warning, prophetically warning. How great is the darkness that it actually translates when he says it? How great is that darkness? It's an agonized question. Not an exclamation. My Bible has an exclamation point. How great is that darkness? That's not what it is. Literally, it translates as how great is that darkness? Why does it have to be like that? It's almost like he was crying out. How 
law, will this darkness prevail? Look at Proverbs 8. Doesn't wisdom cry? Understanding puts forth her voice. She stands at the top of the high places. By the way, the places of the path. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. How many understand that when Jesus came, Jesus came as wisdom in the flesh? Solomon saw wisdom as a female, apparently. When God created wisdom in the flesh, he created it as a male, and it was Jesus. When Solomon wrote that wisdom would cry, the prophecy goes forward to Jesus and backward to David. It goes forward to Jesus. Solomon says, Solomon's prophecy, how many understand God's eternal? It means he's everywhere at once. He saw the beginning and the end and he's there. So when Solomon is crying prophetically the voice of wisdom, his cry is prophetic of Jesus, and it's also prophetic of David. Forward to Jesus, backward to David. This is how Scripture is woven together, and it reveals God's heart. Verse 4 says, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. Look at Psalm 4. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy on me. Hear my prayer. O oh, ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. How many know David is prophesying again the voice of wisdom right here? This is the voice of wisdom crying out. He writes, how long will my glory remain in shame? This cry of David is the prophetic cry of Jesus himself. It's the prophetic cry of wisdom. Wisdom is speaking of glory. How long will my glory, he speaks of glory. The word glory in the Hebrew translates riches and honor. Riches and honor. That's what the word glory translates. Look at Proverbs 8, 18. Riches and honor are with me who saying this. Wisdom. Riches and honor are with me. Durable riches and righteousness. The generation that finds wisdom will recover the wisdom and honor, the riches and the honor of wisdom. How many understand that we have a different view of riches than God does? If you owned a gold mine, how many would like to own a gold mine? You know what you do? You draw gold out of your mind and you live in a much more opulent lifestyle than you do now. Whereas if God were to draw gold out of a gold mine, he would pave streets with it. Right? Why? Because to God, it's just a pavement. It's like black gold. According to God, wisdom is better than silver or gold. Is that true? And according to God, wisdom is better than rubies, wisdom is better than strength, and wisdom is better than weapons of war. That's what Scripture tells us. To seek for wisdom is to seek for the kingdom of God. Wisdom is synonymous with the kingdom of God. It's only by wisdom that the will of God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wisdom is synonymous with the kingdom of God. Look at Luke 17. Ready? Neither shall they say, look here or look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? <laughs> How many believe this? So when Jesus said that the kingdom is within you, he was saying that wisdom is within you. How many believe that? How many question that? How many question what? <laughs> Hidden within you and lying dormant is wisdom. Dormant is when the normal 
function is slowed down or suspended for a period of time. In John 9, Jesus prophesied, the night is coming when no man can work. Didn't he say that? Remember that? He said, the night's coming when no man can work. He said, I'm the light of the world. Work while the light of the world's here because the night's coming. The night he speaks of is a season of darkness and dormancy. A season of hibernation. Darkness is ignorance or the lack of knowledge. And dormancy is work suspended. So the church has literally been in a 2,000 year stretch of hibernation. Wisdom has lain dormant, and darkness rules still over the people. She has retired to the safety of her extremely limiting but also self-preserving cave of religion. And amazing as it seems, wisdom is locked up within you. All the answers of the entire world's problems are right now lying dormant in you. Why wouldn't you seek that? Why wouldn't you seek those openings? I have something I'm going to share next week that's going to expound what we've seen before. It's awesome. Psalm chapter 4, verse 2. O oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? How long will the glory of wisdom be revealed as shame? The word shame there is a mistranslation. It's the Hebrew word which is confusion. How long will the glory of wisdom be continually revealed as confusion? What is confusion? It's when you mix the soul and the spirit. The way of the world is confusion because the church is in confusion. We look at the world and how many know the world's confused? But we don't understand that the confusion starts at the top in the leadership. Who's been placed in the leadership position? The church. Wisdom goes on to say, instead of seeking me, you love vanity. And the word vanity is that which is without purpose. <clears throat> you know what that literally translates? You love that which has no eternal purpose. That's what wisdom says. Wisdom says the problem is you are too attracted by that which has no eternal purpose. Now as Christians, we've been adamantly instructed to deny that this is true. That all we that love is eternal. And things that have to do with eternal purpose. Let me show you something. How may be okay if I show you something? First John 2. This isn't a very long sermon, actually, but this has a lot of good stuff. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away, the lusts are of, but he that does the will of God abides forever. How many believe that you have a pretty good idea of what this verse means, these verses 15 to 17? In your mind, you think, the love of the Father is definitely in me because I'm even able to love the annoying Christians. How many have a hard time loving annoying Christians? Isn't the word synonymous? How many have ever heard a Christian conversation that went like this? That person is so annoying, how can you love them? And the other Christian says, God gave me a love for that person. How many have ever heard that? And I'm not denying that that's true. But this scripture in John is not that. That's not what he's talking about. That the love of the fathers 
in you or not in you. That's not what he's talking about. So put all that out of your head. If you can love annoying people, hallelujah. You are the one. <laughs> when John mentions the love of the Father, he's not talking about God giving you his love toward other people. That's absolutely not it. How many want to step up? How many want to see it from God's point of view? Yeah. He's literally talking about you loving what God loves. The love of the Father is you loving what God loves. Which is what? What does God love? Jesus. And I know every Christian would say, yeah, but I love Jesus. Okay, Jesus is wisdom. Okay, wisdom is the kingdom. You say, I love Jesus. If you love Jesus, then your desperate pursuit should be wisdom, and your desperate pursuit should be the kingdom. The love of the Father. What does the Father love? Jesus said, the Father loves me. Didn't he say that? He said, the Father loves me. Jesus didn't say, he loves you. He said, if you love me, then the Father will love you. Didn't he? If you love me, if you pursue what? Wisdom. If you pursue the kingdom, then the Father will love you. Why? Because you're pursuing what the Father loves. His heart is the kingdom. Praise His heart is wisdom. This literally, this scripture is translated for misunderstanding. It's a misleading scripture to mislead the church into believing that we're good because we have the love of the Father and the rest of it doesn't apply to us. How do you know if you have the love of the Father in you? Love is an energy that cannot be denied. How many know that's true? Love has no ability to remain unexposed. Where there is love, there will 100% of the time, where there is love, there will be pursuit. Always. Where pursuit is gone, there's no love. How many understand that? Love has either gone dormant or it's gone. But where there's no pursuit, there's no love. John mentions three things that block the path of the pursuit of wisdom. How many would like to know what they are? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so Christians would go, okay, lust, lust, and pride. Must be evil, right? Lust, lust, pride. Got to be three evil things. I'm a Christian. Those don't lie. When you hear lust, it is almost always linked to some sort of undeniable sexual urge. But this in John is a poor translation. How many understand that the Bible's been translated, much of the Bible's been translated in order to mislead? It's been done on purpose. Because God has seasons. God didn't want this discovered before the season. It's because God operates always, functions in season. <clears throat> you ready? Lust. Epithumea. Epithumea. That's actually the Greek word. He didn't say lust. He didn't say the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. He said the epithumea. What does that mean? Desire. Or something that draws the thoughts. <clears throat> something that draws your thoughts. A desire is something you want. Let me ask you this. What do you want or what do you pursue in your thoughts? This is literally... Um, when John's talking about it, John mentions the wants of the flesh. He says it's the wants of the flesh, the wants of the eyes. It's literally talking, the, the word is talking about when he says the wants of the flesh, it's the natural world. 
It's actually talking exactly what Jesus mentioned in Matthew 6, starting with verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, don't take any thought for your life. What you shall eat and what you shall drink, nor for your body what you shall put on, isn't the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, by pursuing with your thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take thought? Why pursue your thoughts for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall ye eat? What shall ye drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentile, the world, the heathen, the ones that don't know God, the non-picked, the non-chosen, the non-exclusive, see for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. When Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. How many ever have faith for the things in your life, but then you're still worrying about them again? When Jesus talked about little faith, that's actually what it meant. Short time of endurance. <clears throat> this is exactly right here what Jesus taught in John 6 in this part. This is exactly what John was talking about in 1 John that said, this is the lust of the flesh. How many thought it had to do with sex? <laughs> See? Because he says lust. How many know we need to rewrite that? He's talking about things you want, things you desire, things you think about, things that draw your thoughts away. Instead of your thoughts being drawn to the kingdom, your thoughts are drawn away to the things of life. This is what happens that inhibits the pursuit of the kingdom. Regular, normal, everyday thoughts of what you need, want, desire to exist in life. He said these are the things that hinder the pursuit. John did. He said these are the things that hinder your pursuit of what God loves. Then he says, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes translates the, the natural human desire to be successful. How many want to be successful? Now nobody could ever be afraid of being successful. <laughs> How many know that's, that, that's a big thing? That's, it takes a lot of thought, a lot of energy, a lot of concentration. It literally translates the ambition for success. We call it spiritual names, though, in the church, like purpose. Or God's plan for your life. The lust of the eyes is actually encouraged in almost every Christian church. The weird thing is, John warns us that that's what's going to inhibit our pursuit of wisdom in the kingdom. Yet it's one of the things being preached throughout Christendom this morning. Or yesterday if you're a Saturday. Hmm. <laughs> and then the rest of you are going to hell anyway, so what happens? Hmm. <laughs> the lust of the eyes. Pastors and teachers bloviate. Good word. The Christian child's right to all the good things of the world. It's your right as a Christian. It's your right as a child of God. How many know I can fill in an auditorium preaching? They encourage the child of God to believe that being rich is a true representation of the king. They encourage that. Speak it, confess it, imagine it, believe it. If you give, you'll receive. If you... If you bless, you'll be blessed. If you can believe it, you can receive it. Is this all true? Yes, it's absolutely true. That's the scary thing. It is true. And it does work.
which would you rather have? The blessings of the natural realm or the kingdom? It's your choice. He's not going to be angry about it. It's your choice. It's like when you get to be a grown-up and make your own decisions. As a believer, you get the same. God treats you as a grown-up. And he says, what do you want? And you say, I, I want all these things. And he says, that's fine. But he's looking for the one or the two or the three that say, I want wisdom. I want the kingdom. I want to sacrifice everything for that. He says, I like that. You love what I want. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, despise the whole of the one, despise the other. You can't serve God and man. And I know we say that mammon is money. That's absolutely not what it is. Mammon is that which brings you confidence. Jesus says you can't pursue in two directions. God and mammon go two different ways. That's what he's talking about. You can pursue the things that give you confidence in this world, and he says it's fine. You can't serve, you can't pursue the things that God loves and pursue the things of the world. You cannot follow your heart and God's heart. That's kind of hard, huh? You can't pursue your dreams, your goals, your calling, and God's. Jesus said you will love one and you'll despise the other. Despise is translated kata phreneo. Kata phreneo. He didn't say despise. That was what it was written by the translators. That's not what he said. He said kata phreneo. He said you'll love one and the other, you'll kata phreneo. It means that your heart will choose a direction of pursuit and literally you won't even think about the other. That's what it means. It means you choose a direction. It doesn't make God angry. It just Will God bless your direction? Sure. <clears throat> sure. He's faithful. But it's your choice. How many know in order to be uh, an amazing piano player, you don't start at 55 years old? That's about all I can play. I saw a thing with this little kid. He could speak four languages by the time he was two years old. It's crazy. He's Asian. <laughs> <laughs> he graduated with a doctorate at 15. Why? Because his parents probably didn't let him do anything. He probably never saw SpongeBob once. <laughs> what kind of life is that? Your heart chooses a direction of pursuit, and then you have no regard for the other. It's an absolute trade. One will be traded for the other. You say, I want both. Damn, but I want both. Then you've already chosen. It's like saying, I want to be married and play the field. How many know it's probably won't work? 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the natural realm, the lust of the flesh, he's not saying bad stuff. See, the amazing thing is we look at this and we think this is evil. He's not. He's just talking about normal stuff. This is big boy teachings. He says all that's in the world, the natural realm, the lust of the flesh, desires, the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father. That's not what you pursue to get to the kingdom. Jesus said here, you can't pursue in two directions. The pride of life. The pride of life. John says that all these things are in the world. They're natural realm dynamic that you pursue daily. <clears throat> these things must be overcome if you're to successfully advance in the realm of the spirit. Isn't that what we want? 
Don't we want to advance into the realm of the spirit? How many want more than speaking in tongues? You know, what begs to be understood here is that these things mentioned by John are absolutely detrimental to any potential spiritual growth. They work really well in soulish growth, but they're detrimental to any type of spiritual growth. And we, how many know we are really quick to blame the devil for impeding our progress, but it ain't his fault? We say we can't progress spiritually, and it's because of too many things the devil. It's not. It's because of what I choose. How many know that the devil had a hold, but now that I've chosen the direction, I'm choosing the path. It's from my heart. It's from my own desire. How many know that when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you inherited a disease? And all that disease that you inherited is that your thought process comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the disease. It's, it's, it's to all the church. And it causes you to think the way you think. Overcoming the symptomatic effect of the fruit of that tree is vital to pursuing the kingdom. The pride of life has to do with all that you believe and that you defend as truth. The pride of life has to do with your own beliefs and what you hold on to and refuse to let go. John says that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father. What does that mean? It means that God is spirit and these are roads that lead to natural realm stability. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life lead to natural realm stability. And everybody fears a road that doesn't lead to that. That is a natural part of our makeup. Any road that leads to potential, I'm not sure where this is going. How many love change? Where are all of these roads? All of these roads are in the ways of the mind. The ways of the mind. I had some stuff I'm going to show you next week on this. Just, you know, we, I see this. Some mornings I wake up and I see so clear. I can see it literally in a physical way. And I don't know how many people truly understand the way the mind works. But the kingdom of God is within you. And it's within the paths of the way, the ways of Look at John 3, 3 again. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. How many want to see the kingdom? Praise Amen. You were all taught in church that this verse has to do with being saved. Is that true? And by the vehicle of salvation, you become a good Christian, and then in the end, you go to heaven. Is that true? How many know that that also is true? That's fine. In the end, you go to heaven. You hear this taught over and over, which strengthens your resolve. And so your way of thinking becomes absolutely fixed as the callus over your heart thickens. And so the potential to change that becomes less and less and less and less of you. Your inability to change the way you believe is what John refers to as the pride of life. The pride of life keeps you from changing. You know what I said to Carol? You know the hard part is changing your beliefs and the way you think. 
Because you've been taught it for so long and it was absolute. I said, what if every truth that you're given from God, and how many believe that we're given to you from God is truth? What if every truth given to you from God is given to you only as a sacrifice? God always demanded when sacrifice came, did he always demand the best? So God gives you truth and their paths, but he gives them to you to sacrifice back and to keep going. Not to hold on to build a stronghold of security for yourself, but to sacrifice. Maybe it builds the step that takes you to the next level. But it's a sacrifice. And you say, is that what you believe? Yes. Is that what you believe? Yes. But I keep it beyond. And I just keep letting it go because otherwise I can never advance. Because everything that I hold on to keeps me from advancing. In the realms that are unknown. All these things that keep me secure and safe. And offer me an eternity that I'm sure I have. And that's fine. But it has to do with more than that. It has to do with going beyond that. And finding wisdom in the kingdom of God. And what God loves. Do you know how brave you have to be to let it go? Do you know how brave you have to be to sacrifice what gives you security? Your inability to change the way you believe is what John refers to as the pride of life. Scientific research has found that the more you accumulate facts and knowledge, the more passive your mind becomes. Isn't that an amazing thought? The more you accumulate facts and knowledge, the more passive your mind becomes and the less pursuing your thoughts become. Meaning the massive amount of information that you're fed by Christianity is actually adverse to any spiritual potential whatsoever. It literally destroys spiritual potential. You think you're being fed and wow, we're being fed Fed. We were fed in church today. You ought to go out of here just as more confused than when you came in. <laughs> you ought to go home and fall on your face and say, God, you're going to have to decide this for me. I have no idea. Why? Because religious doctrine makes the, the ground hard and impenetrable and the seed can't grow. Remember, he said, when anyone hears the word of what? It came to them. Understands it not. Then the wicked comes and devours that seed which was so <clears throat> hard heart, that calloused heart, that seed that could produce that brand new result. This is why Jesus said that to see the kingdom, there would have to be a whole new way birth. That's what he said. In order to see the kingdom, there's got to be a brand new way birth. It's got to be birth. It's got to. Something has to open. The, the womb of thought, the womb of what you can. The, the womb of understanding has to. There's got to be doors that have to be opened. Why would he give you keys to doors? If there weren't doors locked. God said through him. Three things Jesus said through him. The Spirit of God said through him. John. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. And we always thought it was things that we sin. And we don't sin so those things aren't blocking us. It's not what he's talking about. It's the things that keep your thoughts. You know, I preached this a long time ago. But there were patterns in the mind. Science proved that. There are paths that, are, that create literal ruts that the mind travels. And it literally stays there. It's like tracks of a train. And it's hard for your mind to go a different direction once these paths are formed. It's hard for you to think something outside of what's normal to you once the paths of the mind are formed. 
And so all these paths continue to take you past all these. I see this every. I see this every day. All these paths. Do you ever get into a rut? You ever try to drive out of a rut? When I was a kid, I lived up a dirt lane. It was a mile long. The dirt would, would, in the winter, would rub the underneath the, of your car because your tires are in the way. If somebody's coming, it's just like the train being on tracks. Unless somebody throws the switch and puts me off on another set of tracks, there's no way I'm going to get out of the way. And that's what your thoughts do. Exactly the same thing. That's how your beliefs work. They form tracks, ruts in your mind. And they just continue to take your mind. Do you know how much rebellion it takes to get off the tracks? Do you know how much you have to fight the steering wheel to get out of the rut? Do you know what it's going to cost you to find wisdom in the kingdom? We're going to continue this, this pursuit. It's an undeniable pursuit. God's given us. I believe that with all my heart. And we'll take up, to be continued, we'll take up where we left off again next week. Amen. Just stay with me. Praise. Father, we bless and honor you. Yes. King of kings and Lord of lords, we worship you. Just thank you, Father, that you continue to take us deeper into the unknown realms, realms that, that you know are there. You said you, in Job, wisdom is hidden, and only you know where it's hidden. We've got, to, we've got to have a heart that's desperate for the things that you love, a heart that's desperate for the things that you desire, yes. a heart that's desperate for wisdom, a heart that's desperate for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us hearts for the kingdom. Yes. That we might know your way, the only true and living God. We worship and praise and honor you in Jesus' name.